Good, so welcome everybody, and uh, particularly warm welcome to Daniela Sief, who's talking to us from um, Hampshire, or the borders of Hampshire and Berkshire. Um, and today uh, she's going to be talking with me about ambivalent mothers and child maltreatment, and how understanding evolution can foster compassion and healing. And um, this is going to be a conversation between me and Daniela. And please do ask any questions as we go through, and we'll try and um, cover them. Um, so uh, Daniela has been working for over 20 years in this uh, field. Um, and she said she's been working to understand the dynamics that underlie trauma, healing, and well-being, and to uh, how to articulate how it feels to be living in the, these dynamics. Um, she's also um, done a book, um, uh, which I think she'll, she'll talk about, um, and did a research um, in evolutionary anthropology at the University of Oxford. So welcome. Thank Daniela. you very much. It's lovely to be with you today. And um, just to say, I'm, I'm talking from uh, not my office. Uh, this is why the background is slightly unusual. <laughs> Anyway, it's a delight to see you. So um, could we just start, Delina, how you got in, into this work in, in the first place? What, what was your background? What, what, what got you interested in this quite difficult area? Gosh, well, it's a long story. So I was always really interested in what makes humans beings who we are. And so I did a degree that had quite a lot of anthropology and evolution in it as an undergraduate and then on as a PhD. And actually, although I didn't think about it at the time, I did quite a lot of research on when sons and daughters are favoured, when parents might favour sons or daughters. And there's a lot of research and kind of quite theoretical stuff in biology. When I tried to read the paper I wrote in it recently, I thought I'm not even under sure, sure, sure I understand what I wrote 30 years ago with the theory. But what happened then was as I moved away from evolutionary anthropology into the world of trauma because of work I needed to do with myself, I came across the work of a Jungian analyst called Marion Woodman, who wrote about the death mother archetype, which she felt was a sort of symbolized by Medusa, the kind of look that turns us to, to stone, that kind of petrifies us and wants us dead. And I did some work with Marion on that. I interviewed her about that. Um, and she looks at it very symbolically. She's a Jungian analyst. So it is all about the images and the symbols and how we take them on board and how they relate to trauma and what it like, feels like of, to be an unwanted child or a child that at some level met that for whatever reason, not necessarily, um, you know, it might be that your mother just hated being a woman at that time and you're a girl and she can't love a girl because she was born at a time when, you know, it, it was pretty horrible to be a girl. So I did that and then I started seeing links between that and the anthropology that I was so rooted in and that where it should be, you know, where I was trained. And I kind of, there was a sense that if I brought that level in, as opposed to looking at, at this phenomenon just in terms of the symbolism, actually start putting the kind of layer to it underneath that said, look, this is part of being a human animal. This is part of what human mothers have been challenges that they faced for as long as hum we've had human mothers, as long as humans have been modern. And if we do that, it adds another layer that brings a whole load of compassion as opposed to seeing this phenomena of negative mothers and mothers who um, may harm their children in one way or another, as opposed to seeing them as you know, purely pathological and somehow unnatural, that we can give it a different context. It doesn't mean that it's okay or it's right or that it doesn't create enormous harm, but it does help us understand those layers of it. You know, a bit like understanding how COVID's transmitted allows us to do something much more easily about COVID than when we didn't under have a clue of what it was about. Yeah. And that was how I sort of made my way to it. Oh. Fantastic. And do, do, do you, in your work, do you work with uh, families, um, like in a psychotherapeutic point of view? Or? No, I am not a therapist. Of I um, consider myself mainly a kind of scholar and a writer, and I'm doing more speaking. 
And I think there's a freedom in that for me to be able to go into very different areas and put pieces together mm. um, without kind of having to, to fit in a box. It also is, you know, I started on the more internal stuff 20 years ago to work with myself. Mm. So most of a lot of the questions, not all, but a lot of the questions are ones that were of interest to me and the kind of hope that if they were of interest to me I'm a human being there'll be other human beings of whom they might they might speak not to everybody yeah. but um yes yeah, so I don't actually work work directly with people no um I mean this is such an interesting topic um so when you when you when most people think about maltreatment I guess they they immediately think oh you know hitting or, or something really um brutal don't they but I, I guess what you're also talking about is something more subtle say for example if if a if a mum or a dad what is expecting or wants a girl and it's a boy and I think that happens a lot actually um I certainly see that in in the therapy room as, as a therapist one can see the, the the ramifications of that sort of expectation and Obviously, mums particularly have all kinds of expectations and, and, and wishes when they give birth, don't they? Um, yeah. No, I think that's true. I mean, I, I think a lot of it, although some of the talks that I do, I, I focus on the more extreme forms because it's a different audience and they don't sort of yeah. get, you know, they're not dealing with the subtleties that you're, yeah. you're working with. But yes, I mean, it can be a sense of you know, if, if mum's lost a child or parents have lost a child and then they have another child hoping that the, the next child is going to somehow allay the grief and the kind of replacement child yeah, yeah. is never going to. And at some level you pick up that you're not wanted, that you're just not good enough. You're not fulfilling that role that, that was hoped for you, that somehow you're inadequate. So it can be very subtle and it can be, you know, and it can also come from a place of love. It can come from a place of, you know, I think parents who've gone through terrible things, face prejudice, you know, um, racism, genocide, have been refugees. Lots of times they have an image of what their child needs to be in order for that child to survive if they get into a similar situation. Mm. So the child must be really fabulous academically or must be this or must be that because that's going to keep them alive mm. or must be really a good, you know, Christian or a really good member of their community because that's what's going to keep them alive. And to kind of make their child into that, mm. they're then going to, they can be quite abusive, not necessarily physically, but kind of constantly shaming or constantly belittling to try and mold a child out of love because they think that the child needs to be a particular way in order to survive should should the situation ever return to what you know what they themselves experience so out of their fear of that and that could be but that can be terribly damaging because that's not the child's experience and then child's living in a you know different world yeah yeah, I mean, I certainly saw that as a teacher, uh, because before I got into therapy, I was a music teacher for many, many years. And um, you see that a lot. And, um, you know, for example, <clears throat> being sent away to boarding school uh, because parents think it's the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, a lot of them had this idea or, you know, it's, you know what you call tough love. Right. So tough and tough on someone up and it's good for their moral fiber or whatever it is <laughs> good for dissociation good for learning well, exactly uh, uh, all, all kinds of trauma and a, a friend of mine is um, a member of the um i think it's called the survivors of prep school education i don't know if you've come across that group but they're they're uh, he's in his 70s now and he still goes to these groups because he was sent away at, uh, at the age of eight you know and and the trauma of that is quite significant but as you say it's done with the best intentions isn't it it is, but you see, I mean, evolutionarily, to go to sort of bring in the other side, if you lose your parents at eight, which is effectively what's happening when you're getting sent away. Yeah. Throughout most of evolutionary history, kids who were sent, you know, who'd have lost their parents at eight wouldn't have survived. Mm. So it's going to bring up also that very deep visceral fear. Of, and of that fear of I'm not wanted because whatever your parents say about we love you 
the facts are they don't want you at home yeah, like yeah. that that's what your body's going to interpret even if that's not what you're phys- you, you know what you're verbally being told that's what your body is i'm not wanted at the place where my parents are yeah and actually evolutionarily you know losing your parents as a eight you might survive i mean if you lose your parents before four or something or you lose your mother before four you don't survive i mean of all the anthropologists i know if you you know nobody knows of a case in hunter gatherers where somebody has lost a parent before the age of four and the kid has lived so i think it brings up you know it brings up all that psychological fear but it's also at the same time it's where the evolution comes in bringing these very ancient fears of and i think just to have a bit more of that in the thing that i think is really important for people to understand because it's so different to what we live now and what we live now is so modern is that for 99.999% of human evolutionary history, between 30 to 60% of kids who are born don't live to their 15. Hmm. Right. Now that's what you have in traditional hunter gatherer societies. Today, I worked with pastoralist society. I worked with um, cattle herding people. I think the child death rate, can't remember it now, but was late thirties, early forties percent. So three or four out of 10 children. It's what it was in Europe yeah, yeah. before we had modern medicine. It's what it is in some really yeah. poor areas. So yeah. ch- for children, life has been incredibly precarious, actually, to survive as a human child. Yeah. And it's very, only a couple of hundred years or even less where nearly every child is going to survive. So the minute you have anything that would have threatened your survival in the past is going to be raped by your body as a threat to your life because it has been until the last 50 years you know it's been for two and a half million years you're not don't suddenly change that in three generations yeah so you read that psychologically as they don't want me and there's all the attachment issues and then that some deep level of body's going yeah from what i understand um so that would be um this this idea of not being wanted or or essentially neglect, I suppose, um, is one of the worst things to understand for a child, to, if, if the child believes that, that they're not wanted. And that can happen, I think, um, sometimes even before they're born, if there's an ambivalence about a pregnancy, for example. Um, and certainly in my work and, and personally, what I've seen is that that is almost like the worst thing in terms of self-esteem if you if you if you don't feel you want it right um and also if you look at um if you look at the animal kingdom say um you know uh, a sheep or, or or a cow whatever it is <laughs> i used to keep goats so i was i'm very uh, sorry a uh, pig so i'm very familiar with the some animals <laughs> and i used to i used to be at uh, witness quite a lot of piglets being born but one of the things again is that if you have separation at birth um, then the mother never really regains that and often the little piglet or lamb dies and but in human society I mean for example when I was born it was traditional that you took the baby away for 24 hours so I'm just wondering how that how that plays out as well i know i, know I think actually i don't think that is so much of a problem in humans one of the things about humans i mean going being taken away for 24 hours is not great but one of the things about humans that we're really different from nearly every other animal is that with most other animals when um mum obviously carries it in pregnancy or mammals and then she produces milk for it but once it's weaned it's independent it mm-hmm. finds its own food Human infants are weaned and then even, you know, in traditional societies, they're 15 to 20 years old before they're finding their own food. They still need other people to be adults to be getting them food. And mum can't do it all because she's got several kids that she's responsible for. So she'll have the one that she's breastfeeding and then there might be a you know, five year old and a nine year old and whatever. And so one of the things that makes humans incredibly unusual in the animal kingdom is that mums need an extraordinary amount of help to bring up offspring. 
And what you so Sarah Hurdy, who's the kind of evolutionary anthropologist who brought this in, calls us communal breeders. And what you find in a lot of hunter gatherer societies is that as soon as an infant's born, it is actually taken away and passed around everybody with the aim of getting it to introducing it to those other people in that community who are going to look after it. And in many of these societies, mum is not the person who is holding the baby the most. She's the person, I'll rephrase that. If you look at all the individuals, mum holds the baby more than any other individual throughout its infancy, mm. but she's still holding the baby less than 50% of the time because a number of other people are taking care of the infant. It might be a, it might be a five-year-old. I mean, you know, half the time the infants are strapped onto the next elder sibling. You know, um, it can be a, a, an elder sibling or an aunt or a grandmother. So, but in many of the hunter gatherers, babies are taken away immediately and kind of passed around the village, and, you know, and everyone holds them. Probably not for 24 hours because unless you've got bottled formula milk and, you know, and, and colostrum and stuff, you, the, you know, the water's dirty and whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but I think, that separation is different to it is in a lot of other species because we are so dependent on these kind of multiple caregivers. And one of the really hard things for mums in our society is that, and the image of mothering we've had is this kind of image that it's all down to mum. Yeah. Um, and I, I've just went to an, a talk, went to a talk on, on Zoom talk this afternoon by some evolutionary anthropologists looking at the effects of, of COVID. And, you know, surprisingly enough, there's been increased postnatal depression. And they put that partly down to the, those who've had smaller networks, mothers who've had smaller networks have been more prone to, to depression. Um, yeah. and, and for human mums, networks have been crucial to keeping your kids alive. If you don't have a network, there's no point trying to keep your kids alive. I mean, grand, in, in many, communities if you've on your first two kids you don't have a kind of teenager to help having a grandmother there halves the rate of child mortality so as if you know 30 40 percent of your kids dying for your first two children if granny's there it's down to 20 percent hmm. that's huge difference yeah. yeah so we are so um i think that is something that you know, and the mothers feel very keenly as to how much support they have as they're going into it. They know in our society, you know, who knows where grannies are living mm. and um, and how much of a community they have to give them that support. And I think without it, there's a kind of, again, a natural ambivalence because throughout all of our evolutionary history till very recently, your kids would not have survived if you didn't have a proper support network. Yeah. So in, in my work as a therapist, because uh, I work a lot with mums and, and a lot with babies, um, one of the things that seems to be really important in terms of healing is for um, both mother and baby to um, be able to tell their story, to be listened to, um, you know, in that process, a lot of healing can take place. And sometimes that, that process is, is limited or stopped by perhaps the, the, the the mother's or the father's own ability to um, integrate what has happened if, if it's been very traumatic for example i remember working for a, a few years ago in um in kuwait i think it was and um working with a family there is um who had twins and and the boy twin died and and there was the, the the parents were so upset that they couldn't even mention this boy's name, let alone go to his grave. And so the the girl was kind of left with it and uh, was incredibly distraught. Um, and that's an extreme example, but 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 one of the things that seems to really help is to encourage a mum to to explain uh, what happened and also that you know if the birth or whatever was traumatic. Um, and I'm wondering that that kind of that kind of process seems to be seems to be really important. And obviously, in in our therapy work, that's something we encourage. 
um, for, for a mum to, to tell their story because part of it seems to me is um, so many people can hold a lot so much guilt can't they about what happened and and particularly when they begin to understand why I think this comes back to the title of your or subtitle of your yes. <laughs> talk really it's like a different perspective of it that, that you understand well, why these things happen if they were generational you know um, it really seems to really help actually because guilt it seems to me is not particularly a helpful thing to feel yes I mean I think uh, that's absolutely true I mean what and, and part of it is we have these ideal images of what mother is. So it's incredibly easy to fail and to feel guilty, mm. right? I failed to keep my child alive. You know, that's so rare in our society mm. to have a child that dies that, that I think at some level you're automatically gonna feel, well, what was wrong with me that I didn't, mm. you know, couldn't keep that child alive? What's wrong with my body or my genes or whatever it is that, that meant that that child didn't. And so that feeling of kind of fundamental inadequacy, mm. I think, yes, when we understand, which, which for me I, I call kind of toxic shame, kind of that kind of, there's something fundamentally inadequate about who I am. And I think it's, it's not helped by the fact that we have this kind of sugar pie idealized image of mums as a natural mum is all loving and unconditionally loving and she'll give up her life for her kids and anything other than that isn't natural because it sets a whole bunch of women up to feel that, that they're not, you know, that they're inadequate, that they're guilty, to, that they're shameful for that. Mm -hmm. And then it's once you feel that, there's two things that happen. One, it's incredibly hard to talk about it because you kind of don't really want to share anyone because mm -hmm. it like makes you feel really bad. And yeah, secondly, yeah. because you feel so bad, you want to try and get rid of what's making you feel bad. And sometimes that's, you know, the child or the infant, right? Because I feel really bad because I'm not looking after this child in the way that I think I'm supposed to and the way that society tells me to. And that makes me a really awful human being and it makes me not natural as a mother and it makes me this kind of monster. Mm. You know, God, it's the baby's fault. If I didn't have this baby, I wouldn't be feeling like this. And then you, or this child, and you get into this vicious cycle of negativity. There was a study in South Africa of women who were really struggling to feed their children, actually. And um, they, they'd feel so guilty about it because they'd bought into those values of mum's supposed to be all giving and all nurturing. Mm -hmm. You know, they said, like, I wish you'd never been born. Well, you know, kids then grow up traumatized. Yeah. There was an example of a woman um, for the talk I'm doing on this next week. I could just read you this quote because I did bring the talk up. I did have it up on the screen. So there's a, uh, a psychotherapist who's now dead called Rositska Parker, who interviewed, wrote a book called Mother Love, Mother Hate. And she interviewed mums who were struggling. And she, one of the mums, an American woman, who was caught in that said, you know, I can remember hurling the baby down on the pillow once and just screaming and not caring. I wanted to kill him really. I think it was to do with being so tormented, worried and guilty. You know, the anxiety and guilt at feeling I was getting it all wrong, that I was just bad and useless. I wanted to get away from that situation. I was unable to tolerate it. So exactly what you're saying, I think, create, you know, once you can talk about it and share it with somebody, that can be shifted of, of you know, you're inadequate and you're getting it all wrong and you're a terrible person because you're getting it all wrong. And that then opens the door to. Yeah. And I guess I, I, this can happen with traumatic events, can't you? If, 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 a, if a birth has been traumatic and maybe a mum feels that, somehow she hasn't done the best for her child or hasn't had the perfect birth or or you know or even the child is slightly injured through it or whatever it is um that there is then an association between the trauma and the child that that makes that quite difficult i think sometimes i think that makes it very hard yeah I've, I've often wondered, and I've, I've talked to quite a few psychotherapists about this, <laughs> uh, in terms of evolution, um, we, we see, oh, I, I think it's so common for mums to feel guilty. And 
and you don't, uh, well, who knows if an animal feels guilt, but anyway, <laughs> but you don't, it seems to be a uniquely human thing, feeling guilty, and, and, and particularly mums around their, their children. In the, from an evolutionary point of view, can you see any reason for that? Any advice? I, I think it's, I don't, I think, um, I think you'd find hunter-gatherer mums are not feeling guilty about their children and how they do it, I suspect. Okay. I think it's because we have these extraordinary expectations and fantasies about what motherhood is in the West. Okay. And I think we are, we've created this kind of sugar-coated image that mums can't but help fail at. I mean, it, you know, when you've only got one or two children, it's different, you know most women in traditional societies and most mothers throughout evolutionary history there's no birth control they're having babies every kind of you know whatever three years four years depending on where they are and how their nutrition is five years yeah some of those survive some of those don't survive there isn't the same pressure to produce this kind of amazing one or two children that we have and to be this extraordinary mum to them you know, you've got to go and get the water. You've got to go and get gather the tubers. You've got to go. So I think it's in the way that we have the kind of intensity of being a mother in our society and these images. And we sell everything from shame in our society. You know, it's, it sells books. It sells mm -hmm. Nike. It sells gym membership. It sells mothering books. It sells the latest baby carrier. It sells yeah. the Mozart tapes. You know, it. If we tell people they're inadequate, they'll buy stuff. Right. <laughs> so I think that there's an element of that. So I think evolutionarily it was very different. And I think also, you know, where I worked, every woman had practically every woman had lost a baby. So it was not and every child will have grown up seeing their mum lose a sibling. Yeah. Right. So a mum isn't a failure for that. That's part of being of just life or having a child who you know was ill who then died at some level or whatever so i think there are things that come with a kind of western society when we have you know two one one and a half whatever are averaging children mm. and all that pressure goes into it and the pressure to be this this thing called a mother which is nothing that human women have tried to live up to what we imagine a mother to be today yeah you can't but help fail yeah and i guess uh, probably in countries like china i think it's dropped the one child policy now hasn't it but that must have been particularly acute there yeah i haven't i've got about five books that i will read for at some point for the next tranche but they are still sitting on my shelf so i can't speak to that at the moment but i imagine the pressure on the children and the pressure on the mums to mother them was in a way that made them you know, incredibly successful, must have been horrendous. Yeah. When we look at um, maltreatment and and even abuse um, and the, the sort of generational aspects of that, I find that very interesting why it is, you know, that someone who is abused will often end up being an abuser. And you see this in cultures as well. And um, could, could you talk a little bit about that and and why it is, for example, if someone has been, um, why someone might then gravitate towards an abusive relationship. Is that because it's more familiar, it's more comfortable in a strange way, even if it's damaging? Well, let me start with the first question about uh, people who've been amused becoming abusers rather than gravitating to the relationship. Yeah. Um, hum one of the things about being humans is that we are extra we've evolved this extraordinary capacity at social learning, which means that you learn by observing others, by copying others, sometimes by explicit learning, but often just by absorbing what's around you. Yeah. And one of the reasons that that gives us is this kind of incredible ability to live in this very, very wide range of environments from the Arctic to the you know tropical forest the way you get food you know if, if you had just were a grazer and you ate grass or whatever mm. 
you know, we need to be able to collect foods in environments that are incredibly diverse. We need to make fires in environments that are very diverse. Fires have been intrinsic to humans, but how you make it in a place where you've got sticks you can rub together is entirely different to if you've got flints. Mm. So those skills have to be learned. So one of the things that is really a human speciality, there's other animals, but nobody does it quite like we do, is social learning, is learning from others, absorbing, copying, and I think that um, that has that shapes every aspect of human life. And I think it shapes mothering. I think girls pick up from childhood. Their own experience becomes the way to mother. And I think part I, this is speculation and somebody would need to test it. And I'm no longer doing kind of proper academic research, collecting data. But I think that what happens in our society is that because mothering is behind closed doors and because kids generally only have like one mother or what you know it's so intense they're only going to pick up and get that experience from one person they might get it from a nursery school they might get something from teachers but it'll be less intense i think in traditional environments you know kids are being mothered by an awful lot of people. They're being mothered by their elder siblings, by their granny, by the aunt, by the next door neighbor, by the person, you know, three huts down, by the older kids. And they're, because so much life is not lived behind closed doors because it's lived publicly, they're seeing a huge diversity of ways to mother. They're seeing people, you know, who are much more tuned and some that are much, uh, who will be maltreating and some who won't be. And so kids pick up this diversity of, this is my theory anyway, but pick up this diversity of ways to mother. Whereas in our society, being we're predisposed to social learning and you don't have very many options of who you learn from. So if, if that's who you learn from, that's who you learn from. And so I think, I mean, it's not, it's not that that cycle is inevitable. There are a lot of people who are maltreated as children who don't go on to maltreat their children. It's not, you know, that that is a direct, always inevitable, but you're certainly at greater risk too. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the kind of evolution behind it is that we've, uh, this, it's a kind of negative side effect of the fact we're so good at social learning, that that's been so important to us. Mm -hmm. In terms of ending up with people who are, um, that's a, I don't think there's an evolutionary point of that. I mean, I think that's a sort of psychodynamic, it is familiar. It is, you know, there's so many times when we will stick to something that's familiar and painful than risk. I mean, we have stayed alive doing that at some level. So we know that, we know how to deal with that. We don't know how to engage in a different way. We've never had an opportunity to learn it. Mm. And I think, you know, I look at myself with bits of my trauma and how they play out, not in that context, but in other contexts. And I look at how hard it is to change some of the things that are self-destructive, but they're familiar. And actually, they've kept me, you know, okay for certain, they might be very painful, but at least I'm still here. If I change them, who knows? Yeah. So I think part of it is, is that there's a, mm. um, but that's a whole, yes. <laughs> um, at the beginning, you mentioned the, the story of Medusa, which is a pretty horrific story. I, I, just, <laughs> I was actually reading it the other day uh, to my stepdaughter and I, <laughs> <laughs> she asked me to stop because it was uh, so upsetting. <laughs> I'm just wondering, could you talk, because I, I, how, how, how did that relate to what you were saying at the beginning? I couldn't quite follow that. Was well, it? Marion Woodman is a Jungian analyst, right, who, I, who, who worked with a deaf mother. So what she's looking for is these kind of mythological stories. Yeah. And what her interpretation, there's a lot of different interpretations of the Medusa myth. Yeah. But her interpretation of it was that um, Athena was born out of the head of Zeus. So she's all intellect. She's no body. She's kind of it's all about head stuff. And then um, Medusa is this very beautiful kind of da uh, daughter of the sea. And she ends up making love to Poseidon in Athena's temple. Yeah. And Athena's so kind of 
shown up by what she's not living, what she's cut off from. She can't bear to see it. So she kind of turns the Gorgon, this beautiful woman, into the Medusa, who becomes this kind of horrendous that turns us to stone, you know, if we, if we look at it, which yeah. is what happens when you meet that energy effectively. When you mm. feel not wanted, mm. you know, we freeze with that. We turn to stone. We, everything inside of us, even if, you know, we can keep going at some level, internally there's this absolute contraction and freezing in terms of meeting it so she marion really used the medusa myth to talk about and explain in part give words and images to our internal sensation the sensation of what happens to the body mm. when we meet that not being wanted when we meet being maltreated and she marion went would go on to say if you meet that enough during childhood, your body starts, you know, turning against you. She you understood her cancer in terms of having met that through childhood. Okay. So, um, and of course, you know, you know, we know that if you've, if you have a very stressful and traumatized childhood, it's going to affect your immune system. I and mean, this must be your area, you know, yeah. and immune diseases are very common among those who carry childhood trauma, I think. Um, you're, you're, if you're living in a state of stress for the whole time, you know, they don't want me, I'm not good enough. They, there's that, whenever they look at me, there was a study done on kids who had very critical parents and they were, um, they followed them kind of very minutely. And what they found was that these kids had really stopped looking at the faces of adults or were looking at the faces of adults much, much less because they didn't want, to, presumably because they just, it was too difficult to see the criticism in their parents' faces. Mm. It was better not to look, so to not to look at Medusa's face. Mm. But, you know, if you're not looking at somebody's face, then you're not getting any of those nonverbal cues that we all need for normal interactions. So then people won't interact with you in the same way, because if I'm doing this, you'll think, well, I'm not really going to interact with her because she's not giving me anything back. Yeah, so you'll yeah. stop interacting with me. And then I'll think there really is something wrong with me because nobody likes me now. Yeah. But you're not aware of it because it's so subtle. So I think that's the kind of what the Medusa came in, what, what happens inside of us, what we feel when we meet that. That's very interesting, yeah. Um, I'm wondering from your work also, um, because, because there's the new area of psych psychology, really pre prenatal psychology, um, and we're a bit involved with the Association of Pre- and Perinatal Psychology in America. And so um, more and more, they are looking at the impacts of uh, these kind of things you're talking about in pregnancy. Um, and to give you an example, I think in, in America, um, something like 50% of, of pregnancies are unplanned. So you could say that there is an ambivalence there around whether a child might be wanted or not, for example. And I'm just wondering how that, that kind of prenatal stuff comes into your work. It doesn't. I mean, I don't really know about it. I'm sure there's stuff going on with the stress system as well, but, but you'd need to get someone else to come and... Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's interesting because in a way... Um, I, I know there's a lot that has been more and more research on on prenatal stress and that's talked about a lot and that's another <laughs> in a way that can be another thing that's sort of imposed on mums that they can't be you know they have to be nice and calm and relaxed yes. but it is another thing that's in i mean it, you know it is which is not particularly helpful but having said that um if you are growing you know as a little baby a fetus in in your mom's womb and you're being marinated in high levels of cortisol and adrenaline and all that kind of stuff. It's like you get used to that. That's your normal. Um, and, and also that it seems that a lot of things that happen at that time are obviously pre-verbal and possibly pre-cognitive. So there, there's something that a baby might be born with but doesn't really know why we might be feeling something what why why someone might be addicted to stress and things like that and again there's quite good even i mean there's quite good evolutionary reasons um for 
if mum stressed having a stressed baby. So, um, and you see it throughout the animal kingdom, you see that if parents are living in dangerous and stressful environments, often that is transferred to the infant in some way and that makes sense because actually if you've been born into a hostile world you know most stress is not the kind of stress we're meeting in the west today most of the stress was god the lion population has really gone up or you know um we're in the middle of a famine and there's no food or you know the neighbors want our water so there's a drought and we are sitting on the best water and we're in you know fights about the water or whatever it is and if you're being if you're born into a hostile world then actually the best thing that you can do for your child is to make it afraid mm -hmm. because that's going to give it a greater chance to survive so there's a tiny little thing called a water flea which is like microscopic right mm -hmm. and if it's born in a pond where there's a lot of predators it takes a form where its shell is seven times thicker than if it's born in a pond where there's no predators, right? So at birth, and it has a huge helmet, it lives less long because it takes a lot of energy to build the shell, but you know what? It's gonna live. Right. <laughs> and actually that was part of, I think that, that pat, we see that pattern in every, I mean, that, you know, goes from water fleas, which are these little kind of insecty things to rats to, humans to everything and it makes a lot of sense if you're born into a dangerous world and I uh, I mean that was part of my story my mother was a holocaust refugee and she was determined unconsciously but she left Poland on day three of Hitler's invasion just made it out mm -hmm. bribed her way across the border she was 11 9 yeah. she was determined that I was going to grow up frightened of the world wow because if I was looking for danger everywhere that was what was going to keep me alive Right. I didn't trust. That was what was going to keep me alive. I'm always looking for where the exits are. Right. Yeah. And and that what you know, I look back, it caused a lot of damage in terms of a lack of trust. And it's made things very, very difficult. Makes complete sense from her perspective. Yeah, absolute sense. Yeah. You want this kid at this particularly to anti-Semitism, you want this kid absolutely hypervigilant. Yeah. And to make sure for her, you know, the I really she needed me, or she, the pressure was to be academically excellent, because if there was another Hitler and I had really good academic credentials, then any country would take me as a refugee. Wow. Wow. It was all about how to make this my wow. daughter who I love. A, most likely to see the danger when it comes out, yeah. and B, most likely to be accepted if she needs to flee somewhere else. Wow. Right? She wasn't conscious of that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes she was. Mm -hmm. but, um, but that's, you know, but water fleas are doing something similar when they're building a helmet and they're putting. So the problem is that with a lot of the stress that people are having now, there is it's not about fleeing it's not about predators so you're getting you know it's about stuff that it's this chronic stress that you know so actually we're not living in dangerous worlds and the fact that you have this hypervigilant fear system makes the world dangerous yeah. you know because the number of times that i'm going oh i don't trust you at some level yeah you know and then people back away because they're feeling something from me that's you know not great or i'm very you know that you're asking for reassurance and reassurance and more reassurance and more reassurance yeah and actually then people go well i've had enough of this <laughs> you know and you create the very the problem with being primed in that way is that especially as humans is you create the very thing you don't want yes but it's different if you're living in an environment with lions you know it's good to be on the lookout for them yeah there's cost to that there's cost to your social relation you know if you look at vervet monkeys and then high the little gray monkeys they're all over africa if they're in an environment where there's a lot of predators they spend much more time looking around mm. less time grooming less time feeding less time caring for their young they have a you know but hey better to spot the leopard than yeah it's all about so 
I, but it's hard because we're look, you know, we're living in societies where we don't have that danger. So it's all being misplaced and there's nowhere quite for it to go in a way that's constructive. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. We've done a few webinars on, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the polyvagal theory and um, all that. It's been interesting in terms of like, it seems like your, our nervous systems, and when, when, certainly when babies are born, their nervous systems are, are designed to be socially engaged. So because we are essentially tribal and we need each other to survive, don't we? Um, and one of the things for that to happen is that you have to switch off your cues of danger so it's almost like we are cued in for, for, for seeking safety first of all um, and that's embedded in our nervous system as far as i understand i think also because with human infants because there has been this overlap between children there have been times when mums have had to decide you know infanticide is not uncommon in traditional societies so in a lot of hunter gatherers if mum's got a breastfeeding child and she has another child you can't be a gatherer walking 10 kilometers a day with a breastfeeding three-year-old and a newborn you can't do it you'll end up so malnourished yourself you'll die as a mother and if you die all the kids are going to die yeah. So there are a number of circumstances in and, you know, if you have a child that's got congenital issues and you're a hunter gatherer, you're incredibly mobile. It's not going to make it in that world. Right. Yeah. If you're in a society that's moving every day and we've got walking 10. Everyone has to walk 10 kilometers to get food, yeah. whatever. So, you know, among the Kung, when they were being the initial research back in the 60s, the figures they thought was like one in a hundred babies was not picked up at birth. Wow. And we basically have some version of that in practically every hunter gatherer society that's ever been studied. Mm. And I, so I think that human babies in particular are primed looking for danger or safety because I suspect that has been part of the human condition ever since we started having these, these several kids dependent at the same time. Right. Mums have been in a position where um, there are times when they just can't look after all the kids. So I suspect human babies are particularly sensitive to any sign. Sarah Hurdy, who kind of brought all the evolutionary ideas to mothering, argues, you know, a baby who was particularly sensitive had more chance of, of making the right smiley faces or whatever not to be. But it has been part of being a human for the reasons that are kind of that make us the good side of what we are these very long childhoods with all this learning mm -hmm. means that mums have there been trade-offs and women have had to choose between babies at times and life for babies have not been you know safe thank you um if there's any questions please do put them in the chat which are going to have to wind up in a sec do you want to mention your book daniela um, well, my book, which is I do the <laughs> PR bit. Yes, so my um, was a series of interviews with people around childhood trauma and its healing. So there is an interview with Sarah Hurdy, who brings all the evolutionary side in. A lot of I'm talking. There is an interview with Marion Woodman, who also talks about death mother in it. Yeah. So. Um, uh, there's an interview with Alan Shaw, who's done a lot of the infant yeah. work. Yeah. Um, and Dan Siegel, who's done mindfulness. Yeah. So my idea in the book was to try and make these people's ideas accessible, yeah. um, but still give a sense of depth. I'm currently writing with my own ideas now, and, and I'm not sure I'm going to say this publicly, but I'll say it. So the idea is to do a book on the kind of death mother and the maltreatment, where I bring together those different threads with my, un drawing it together with my understanding. And I am also writing about about trauma and healing. Your website is um, uh, daniellacf.com, isn't it? Yes, and it's Daniella right. with one L. But yeah, that should be and CF. Yeah. yeah. Yes. See, S I E W F. So that's where anyone can find me. Wonderful. Great. Well, I think if you don't mind, we'd probably just have to wind up now. Oh, okay. So for you. Um, we're 10 minutes short of the hour, but I do need to go. So um, thank you so much for being here. I really enjoyed that. Is there anything you want to say before we 
before we stop? Have we covered everything you wanted to cover? Um, yes, I mean, it, it's been lovely to be able to cover both sides of it, actually, the evolutionary and the more kind of psychodynamic and yeah. look the inside. It's been lovely to have the opportunity to weave those together. So I've really enjoyed that. Um, if, if there's questions that other people have that they haven't understood or bits that they want more of, you can contact me through my website. And I'm kind of interested in, in that because if I am writing about it, it's always helpful to know what people didn't understand or, you know, I'm happy to um, contribute on that. There are a couple of articles. So, um, but no, it's been really lovely to have that opportunity to, to bring and weave together in that way. So thank you for opening that up and, and yeah, participating in that. A rich area to explore. Thank you so much, Ben. That was really wonderful. Thank you. And just to say, next Thursday, we have uh, Karen Melton, um, who's going to be talking to us uh, at 7 p.m. next uh, Thursday. If you have a look at ourbirthjourney.com, uh, all the details are up there.